profile. He's a software development engineer and test at Microsoft Studios on the Connected Experiences team. Operating as a lead tester on as many as seven games, game titles at a time. It hasn't been an easy road to get to the location that he's at, working for the last 13 years in software testing in various roles and not always in the games in the industry. Prior to entering software, he worked in construction briefly and before that eight years in the military. So please welcome Jason Wolfile. So as I was explaining earlier to Rebecca and others, when we all of the plans that I had to have a slide deck just kind of took a left turn for pressing priorities at work, and, and that kind of works into my uh, my guided talk <laughs> of uh, what my job is and what software testing is, and being a lead tester on seven projects and what it does. And then also to talk, originally I was going to talk about the differences between the three different disciplines as I see them, you know, program management, development, and software test. Um, and the more I've thought about it throughout the week, it's, it's the similarities between the three. Everybody's a, a tester of sorts. If you go to the grocery store and you use the debit card machine, and then you go to a different store and use their debit card machine. The differences between those two things sometimes set you as the consumer off or the user off, which kind of feeds into usability testing. If usability was the same across those, those transactions would be a lot similar. Everybody tests something every day, whether or not they realize that they're testing it. And ultimately, you have an opinion about how that works or how it doesn't work and what you would do to make it better. And that's really what software testing is. Now, mind you, there's sets of parameters. There's um, different criteria that you have to meet. But it's it really boils down to a yes, no, do I like this or not? Do Does this function as I intended it to or not? And and where that um, where those differences are. <coughs> um, and pardon me, but I'm just winging at this point, too. Uh, when you look at the program management aspect and the software development aspects of, um, of the industry in general, they're also doing all those same things. The developer's testing his own code. A program manager isn't worth the salt if he's not testing the code that his developers are making. Um, and, and so those aspects, everyone tests. And so it's relatively easy to get started in software testing in the software industry by, a, by being a software tester. It's not necessarily easy to go that route and be the professional, be the consummate software tester for 13 years, for 20 years, for however long you decide to make a career out of it. I know several people that have made you know, a 20, 25 year career out of software testing, and I know several people that have used it as a stepping stone into um, their foot in the door to be a developer or to be a program manager, um, or to work elsewhere. In whether it be marketing or, um, or technical writing or anything else. But software testing is one of those easy throw bodies at it. Everything needs it, whether it be Office or IE or a website or a game. Now, all of that said, those are the similarities across, in, in my opinion, across all of software. Um, Hardware can be lumped in there too, it's very similar. It's still using software to function as well as um, you know some hard lines to, to make sure that certain capacities work and whatnot. But aside from that, testing is testing. Now, I work in games. Now I don't know if you guys are all interested in games, but you know it's it's one of those, it's a 17-year-old's dream to, you know, 17-year-old boy's dream to work in games. And anybody can as a software tester, I'll tell you that right now. Um, but generally speaking, you can start at minimum wage and do seven years I've seen guys do because they don't want to climb up the ladder, they don't have the ambition. 
they're not finishing a degree or um, even looking to further educate themselves. They're just playing a game, Grandma's Boy. Right? You know, if anyone's seen the movie Grandma's Boy, it speaks to it relatively well. <laughs> it's kind of the, the stigma of what game testing is. Um, I started in doing website testing back in the, in the late 90s when you needed a pulse to test software. And the dress code was, um, so long as it's pink on your body, it's covered, right? And, and if you use your imagination, you can kind of figure that out. And there were people that broke those rules and still stayed employed. During the dot-com bubble burst, uh, a lot of those people went away and, and went into other careers because the software testing industry or the software industry was starting to get more and more professional in this area. Um, during that dot-com bubble burst, uh, I went through a stint of unemployment and landed in games almost 10 years ago. Next month, it'll be 10 years ago. And I started, because I had that couple years underneath me, I started as a uh, software test engineer two on a contract at Microsoft doing multiplayer testing and looking at network topology, um, testing games, working through that network topology, and making sure that they functioned not only as intended and, and keeping with the standard that Microsoft was trying to put forward, but also dealt for the consumer in their best interest. Um, throughout, at, well, after 2002, I uh, moved on to several other projects um, and, uh, and left Microsoft for a period of time as a contractor and, and landed last fall back at Microsoft, back where I wanted to be and back where I loved. And it's an intense industry, games. Far more intense than uh, Office. Office has a has a product cycle of two to three years. If I was at Microsoft at the pay rate and level that I'm at, I would own maybe half of the file menu, and and that would be my set of testing. And I would have on every build, I would have between two and four weeks to to test out my features and my responsibility areas fully and report on that and wait for a new build to do regressions and continue testing on those feature sets. Where I'm at, I own seven products end to end, start to finish, and I'm responsible for them before they go into full production, all the way through into post-production. The first title since, um, since I started at Microsoft just released uh, earlier this week, and we're already looking at two title updates to fix a couple of issues that have been found uh, by consumers, as well as a uh, add-on content pack. And so I still own those things out in the wild. And I'll continue to own them for the life of the product, for the life of the product, um, which generally speaking is about two to two and a half years. <laughs> That's not the case elsewhere in the industry. Everywhere else has its own nuances. Um, I.e. Or, or office, I could move around within the team after it shipped. I could stay on the team and uh, work on updates for it, or I could stay on the team and work on the next version. Um, and so I, I really enjoy where I'm at, and yet to sit here and say that I'm a lead tester on games I don't pick up a controller much more than about an hour a week. The majority of my my job is to manage the process. Um, I have several, uh, I have an external test team with several testers that I have to manage my products as well as um, keep in mind my 15 peers that each of them have six products and what's going on through their testing efforts as well. There's a team of about 80 down in Portland that works on our stuff. And each one of those individuals has several of our projects under their belt. And depending on where they are in the, in the different portions of the cycle, I have to figure out and fight for my projects to boil up to the top for priority or down. 
So a lot of what I do is can be considered program management. On top of it, I also have to know everything that's going on in the game, where it's failing and where it's not. And when it's failing something, I need to be able to communicate to the developer exactly why and what they're doing wrong. And so I'm diving into the code, looking at it, and telling them where they need to fix and uh, anything to change, how to make that change, or put them in contact with the experts that do. And so I have to be an expert in who knows those things. Um, so as a tester, as a lead tester, and at least where I'm at, um, I do program management, I do development, and I do test. And, and yet test falls squarely on my shoulders and none of the rest. <coughs> program managers, same thing. They do a lot of tests. They have to know experts. They have to know code. Developers, same thing. Um, so it's all a matter of where you wind up sitting. <coughs> and what your title is as to what's going to happen on your day to day. It's not always an easy job, but it's definitely rewarding. And, uh, and it's been a, a fun road to get to where I'm at. Now, I've talked two complete circles. And I've gone off in three different directions. And like I said, I'm winging it, so I apologize. Have I, does anyone have any questions where I'm at? And where would you like to see it go? What, what parts of being a software tester or being in the industry kind of um, is is stuff where you want to know about, or being in software in general? Anyone? No one? Really? Sure. Well, I'm just kind of interested in the whole um, developing a narrative, like a writing a story for the game to implement. Okay. That's something that, that was talked about in my nonfiction writing certificate program okay. at UW, and I, that sounded interesting. Like something I might be interested in getting involved. To to be more of a story plotline developer and whatnot. Okay, so. In my understanding, and I haven't sat in that end of it, but in my understanding of what goes on, a game designer comes up with the brainchild of what a game is going to be and where he'd like it to go, and comes to a writer and says, make me a story to fill between A and B. And there's cycle and development, just like there is in software in that. You, you come up with your plot line, you see what he's looking at, you come up with your own ideas, develop your plot line for section A to B, or whether that be from the beginning to the end of the game, or this section of the story, or whatever, depending on the size of the game, too. And, and you're responsible for that from beginning to end. He then drives design and, and um, design of the game, as well as development of the game, in those directions to fill in uh, the holes, or to fulfill the storyline that you've written. Um, it's an interesting end, and I don't know enough about it to, to fully comment. Um, I've known a couple of, of designers and writers uh, throughout my time that are interesting and nuanced people. Uh, they're a lot of fun to, uh, to sit down and pick their brain about where they want to see the game go as well. Um, they're also a great source of history on a title when you're talking a larger title like Halo or Gears of War or something that's a three-year development cycle. Um, they know that story very thoroughly from start to finish. So. How would you get into, how would you get your portmanteau or design? I would look at, if, if I were going after it today, I would look at uh, technical writing skills. I would look at understanding a, a bit of game design and uh, possibly take a course or two on, on good design. I would look at uh, creative writing classes and um, possibly go after, if it was me, I'd go after getting like a, a, um, a lit heavy degree and, and advertise myself that way as well as be 
knowledgeable of, of what's available depending on the companies that you're applying to. Mm -hmm. yeah. So what are some of the key companies besides Microsoft? Well, in the greater Seattle area, the last time I did a check, about nine months ago, there were 36 independent game development companies. And that goes from Microsoft all the way down to the two guys in the garage that actually have a business name registered, right? Um, every one of those companies needs that in some aspect, but they might not source for it. Um, the larger companies will, uh, smaller companies won't necessarily. The, the game, the lead developer is also the program manager for the company, he's the CEO, he's also the game designer, he's doing everything, you know, eight hours a day. And, and that can go from a casual game like Peggle on up through whatever. So what are the, some of the better companies to work for, the larger companies? Wow. <laughs> the larger companies are, are usually better to work for, um, in my experience. Uh, your benefits are better, they understand personnel better, your work-life balance is a lot better, um, as well as, uh, as just the general exposure and security of, of working for a larger company, you know, general exposure of other projects and other aspects that you can do through your career and the security to know that if you're good enough at what you're doing and it comes time for a drawdown, you can just be shifted into another position or they'll help you shift into another position and take on another hat, you know, or three or six. Um, obviously, I work at Microsoft, I would say Microsoft, but um, I've worked for Wild Tangent, who no longer develops games, but they work with, I think the partner list when I left was over 280 different external development partners throughout the world. Um, there's Big Fish Games in downtown Seattle, there's PopCap, there's I think Amaze renamed themselves uh, recently, but Amaze Entertainment, if you do a search for them, you'll probably get whatever their new name is. Um, Blue Mobile. What's that? Blue Mobile. Blue Mobile. Um, there's, um, if you were to, to drop into um, the IGDA.com website, Independent Game Developers Association website, and look at, I don't think that they've updated their list in about two years, but they hold talks um, in the area pretty frequently, at least once a quarter from what I recall. Um, and a lot of different companies uh, go there to, to recruit or to talk about their direction or to talk about their vision. And, and try and get others on board to move in that direction. And what, is, what are the uh, acronym again? IGDA. <laughs> you said that there's such a thing as a game design course. Where, where are they all? Um, so there used to be a, uh, I forget what the course was here, what the course was called here, but I know um, that there's a few other colleges in the area that have offered a game design and development course um, that's specific to game design and development. Which college colleges do you know? I don't know. Thank you. Yeah. Does anyone else have a question or a comment? Sure. Um, so, like I said, I've got seven different games under my plate. The majority of them are developed in C++. Um, but I do have one right now that originally started as an XNA game. And uh, XNA is C Sharp. And it's, it's, well, it just got shown at PAX East. Did really well. Got great reviews. And uh, it's currently slated to release sometime late in the summer. What's PAX East? Hmm? What is PAX East? PAX East. PAX PAX is uh, Penny Arcade Expo, which will be here in the fall. As it is 
every year. Or Labor Day weekend last. this year. What's that? Labor Day weekend this year. Is it this year? Yeah, yeah. they don't have offered tickets. So. Yeah. It's one of those. My, the guy that sits next to me, he's on my team and whatnot, is a uh, pork pro. If you know Pax, Penny Arcade at all. He's the character for pork pro. Um, but there's, you know, several other job fairs and, and uh, talks in the area. Seattle is, the greater Seattle area is known for game development. PopCap's here. If you follow any game news, PopCap got bought by EA for, I think it was $1.2 billion last year. Um, there's um, a couple of major space as well as uh, full game title space. What's the difference between casual versus full game? Uh, so the definition of that is kind of changing in the industry right now. Um, my definition and, and the generally recognized definition of a casual game versus a, a full size game is a full size game is going to be six, seven gigs in size. Um, be a production cycle of two to three years, typically. And um, cost in the millions of dollars to develop and produce and release to market. A casual game is smaller scale. Same, can be same scope, but smaller scale. Quicker development cycle built on an existing engine, usually. Um, smaller dev team, smaller test team, smaller budgets, and uh, I've got one that was just greenlit last week and is slated to release to public in October. And so the compressed timeline of that is relatively dramatic when you look at something like Halo that's a three to four year development. But it's also not going to generate the revenue that Halo is and, and so on and so forth. Additionally, casual is also easy to pick up and put down. Decent general rule. If you can find it in one to two different spots on the web or on different consoles or whatever, it's easy to it's easy to pick up and put down. Your saves are, are relatively quick or your progress is relatively quick. Um, but so is the game. You're not looking at 40 to 50 hours of gameplay, you're looking at five to 10, me. Come on. So what are some of the job fairs that they hold in the area? Several. There's several different job fairs. They're sometimes advertised um, radio ads, but sometimes they're not. Sometimes they're just advertised in little tech papers or um, on a website, you know, such as those, you know, the ad, whatever job fair, and that's the first time I hear about it. I haven't been to a job fair in probably two years, but I've been steadily and relatively uh, stably employed for over that period of time, and so I haven't had a huge... So, um, what website should you visit, or can you say... Anywhere else that you would go to, to look for any sort of job. Again, IDGA.com. Mm -hmm. um, nine months ago, had a relatively decent list. Um, most of the companies that were on that list, like I said, hadn't been updated in two years, but most of the companies were still around. And, uh, and those are all indies where they're not like um, full funded by a large, large corporation. Mm -hmm. So, but I think Microsoft Studios was even listed on that side as a top. Which doesn't quite make a ton of sense. Microsoft's not too independent. We have some smaller studios. They, we do have some outlying studios. Experiences team, which is um, 
Xbox Live Arcade, Windows Mobile, Windows 8, and games for Windows Live. So I own titles on each of those platforms, and, and in some cases on a couple of those platforms at the same time. So um, I don't know that they set up a studio specifically to do mobile development, but they have a studio that does mobile development. Yeah, if for students who are wanting to break into this industry, is there anything in particular you think they should emphasize on their resumes? Tenacity, which doesn't come across well on a resume. Um, show your willingness to learn. Show your willingness to not give up. And, um, and be creative. If you're looking at games, that's... I, I would go to Office, or I would say go to Zoom, or um, go to Expedia, and and look at doing something that's not games. Um, the best testers are are the most well-rounded and have the experience to be able to abstractly look at software. Um, so when I am in a game with a sword and enemy. When I hit an enemy and I expect an effect to occur, that's, in my mind, that's the same as pushing a button and expecting a window to pop. I'm looking for that, that cause and effect. And the best game testers are the ones that can do that um, abstractly, but the best software testers are the ones that can also do that abstractly, whether it is a program or a game or a whatever. Right is is the ones that can break down bit by bit in a black box state or in a white box state what those differences are and what they can expect to move forward. of the general public are in these games. And, and I can say from my own experience that it's not about um, it's not about as much about the interaction of the child with the game as much as it is about the interaction of the parent with the child. And, and 
And again, that's my experience. But yes, to answer your question, yes, there are some quite a few studies that um, that have been published and are publicly available about ESRB makes all of their stuff public. What's the ESRB um, The I don't something rating board. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't know. How about um, RPG? Role playing games. Okay. Are, do girls prefer those? Yeah, they do. <laughs> <laughs> Generally speaking, if you're going to paint with a broad brush, no. She's absolutely right. There's a change. You know, some. I don't. Currently, I work in in a casual game space, and. And my amount of time that I'm able to game and devote to game as a uh, single father with two kids full time, as well as a job and a, and a new blossom in my career, I don't have time to sit down and play Skyrim, which is a 40 to 60 hour play through. Skyrim? Skyrim. Skyrim. That's a role playing game? Yes. So, um, What's the difference between the amount of games that girls like and the amount of games that guys like? Is it the same thing? I don't think so. It's a personal choice. It, more than anything. Um, the industry about 10 years ago tried to do a um, tried to do a lot of, okay, these games are made for girls and we're going to market them fully at girls. These games are made for boys and we're going to market them fully at boys. And what they found was a flop in both. Um, there was a complete downturn in, uh, in sales of, of both um, groups when they marketed them that way. So game designers, game developers, um, producers started looking at, well, let's just make a great game. What game would I want to play? And if I want to play it and I've got years of gaming experience, I think I have a pretty good opinion about that, and, and let's go in this direction. And then people pick it up and go through. Now, you like RPGs. What are some of your favorites? 